leaving the king very ill at ease and without taking any of his refreshments, the Magi set out with their caravan for Bethlehem. Soon after they had passed out of the city gate, they again perceived the star and burst into cries of joy and happy songs. Then they camped for a while and said some prayers, and all of a sudden a spring of clear, fresh water gushed out of the ground before their eyes. Taking this as a good omen, they built a small pool and let their animals drink their fill. The three kings now ate their first meal since leaving Jerusalem. Later in the day, they continued on their way over the hills of Judea to Bethlehem. When they arrived in the city of David toward evening, the star disappeared again and they felt somewhat anxious. They were directed to the Valley of the Shepherds as a suitable place for the caravan to camp overnight. After their servants had put up a large tent and had begun to unpack provisions, the three kings suddenly perceived the star shining with extraordinary brightness over a nearby hill. Then a beam of fiery light descended from the star onto the grotto, and in this ray the Magi saw a vision of the Holy Child. Reverently taking off their headdress, they slowly walked over to the hill and found the entrance to the stable. Gaspar pushed the door open and caught sight of the humble Mother of God sitting with the infant Jesus at the far end of the cave, which was filled with a heavenly light. Both mother and child were just as the kings had seen them in the vision a month before. Saint Joseph and an old shepherd now came out of the grotto, and the Magi told him very simply and modestly that they had come to worship the newborn King of the Jews and to offer him their gifts. Whereupon Joseph welcomed them with touching friendliness and cordiality. Then, accompanied by the shepherd, they returned to their tent in order to prepare for the solemn ceremony by which they planned to honor the Savior. And after having assembled their gifts and put on their great white silk cloaks, they set out for the grotto in an orderly procession with their relatives and servants. When Mary knew that the Magi were approaching, she asked St. Joseph to stay at her side, and she calmly awaited them, standing with her son in her arms, her head and shoulders covered with her veil, in perfect modesty and beauty, with a celestial light shining in her countenance and shedding over her a majesty that was more than human, even amid the extreme poverty of the stable. After taking off their sandals and turbans, the three kings entered the grotto. At their first sight of the mother and child, they were overwhelmed with reverence and admiration, and their pure hearts overflowed with joyful devotion. By a special permission of God, they also perceived the multitude of resplendent angels who were attending the King of Kings. Then the three magi simultaneously prostrated themselves very humbly on the ground and fervently worshipped the Divine Infant, acknowledging Him as their Lord and Master and as the Savior of all mankind. When they arose, Mary sat down, holding Jesus on her lap, and the kings approached her, for they wished to kiss her hand, as they customarily did to the queens in their countries. But the Queen of Heaven and Earth modestly withdrew her hand and said, My spirit rejoices in the Lord, because among all the nations He has called you to behold the eternal Word incarnate. Let us therefore praise His name. Then she uncovered the upper part of the Christ child's body, which was wrapped in red and white swaddling clothes, and with one hand she supported His head while she put her other arm around Him. The infant Jesus had His tiny hands crossed on His chest as if He were praying, and all His features seemed to radiate joy and love. Seeing the divine babe of Bethlehem thus, the three kings fell on their knees before him and again adored and worshipped him. 
their hearts became inflamed with a burning mystical devotion for him. And in a fervent silent prayer, they offered to the Christ child their kingdoms, their peoples, their families, all their possessions, and their own selves. They humbly begged him to rule over their souls and thoughts and all their actions, to enlighten them and to give happiness, peace, and charity to the world. Tears of joy and devotion ran down their cheeks, while all they could say was, We saw his star. We know that he is to reign over all kings, and we have come to worship him and to offer him our gifts. Then Gaspard took from a purse hanging at his waist a number of small gold bars and laid them at Mary's feet. Next, the copper-skinned Balthazar placed a golden censure with green incense on a table in front of Jesus. Finally, Melchior came forward and left on the table a lovely little flowering shrub which gave forth myrrh. As each gift was presented, the divine infant smiled and waved his arms in a very lovable way, while Mary nodded with touching humility and spoke a few words of simple, heartfelt gratitude to each of the three kings. Then they congratulated St. Joseph on his good fortune in being chosen as the husband of the mother of the Messiah, and expressed their profound sympathy over the dire poverty in which the Holy Family was living. After the Magi had been in the stable for three hours, they withdrew, and their servants were allowed to enter in groups of five and to adore the child Jesus. Meanwhile, outside the grotto, the Magi and their relatives stood around a great old tree and joyfully chanted their evening prayers. Then they went to their tent, where St. Joseph and some of the shepherds had prepared a light supper for them consisting of bread, fruit, vegetables, and honey. As he sat there eating with the good kings, Joseph was so happy that his eyes filled with tears. And when he returned to the grotto, he and Mary were overflowing with a joy that they had never known before, as at last they saw how Almighty God had brought to his incarnate Son the honors and gifts that were due to him. The next day, the Magi generously distributed food, clothing, and money among the needy families of Bethlehem, and they sent their servants to the grotto with many choice presents, which Mary set aside for charity. The kings planned to return to Jerusalem the following morning, and so they now went to say farewell to the Holy Family. First, they consulted the Blessed Virgin concerning many mysteries of faith and the practice of religion in their daily lives and duties. Her words were so filled with divine truth that the wise men were deeply moved and wished that they did not have to part from her. When they presented some gems of great value to her, Mary respectfully refused them. They also offered to have a comfortable house built for her, but she humbly thanked them without accepting. When at last the kings had to leave, the Mother of God allowed each of them to hold the Christ child in his arms. And as each did so, his face became transfigured with joy, and he wept tenderly. At the door, they very fervently begged Mary and Joseph to pray for them. Then, in order to make them happy, Mary suddenly unwound her long yellow veil and handed it to Gaspar. The three magi bowed low before her and gratefully accepted this precious relic. And when they looked up, their hearts were thrilled with reverence and love as they contemplated the full heavenly beauty of both mother and child. After chanting their evening prayers, the kings and their attendants retired for the night until about midnight an angel warned them in a dream to leave at once for the east without passing by Jerusalem. Within less than an hour, the caravan had quietly packed up all its equipment and after a last touching farewell to St. Joseph, 
the Magi silently vanished into the night, guided by an angel. The Blessed Virgin said to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreta, My daughter, great were the gifts which the kings offered to my most holy son, but greater still was the affection with which they offered them and the mystery concealed beneath them. I wish you also to offer up similar gifts, for I assure you, my dearest, that there is no more acceptable gift to the Most High than voluntary poverty. There are few in the world who use temporal riches well and offer them to their Lord with the generosity and love of those holy kings. You too can make such an offering of the things necessary for sustenance, giving a part to the poor. Your ceaseless offer, however, must be love, which is the gold, continual prayer, which is the incense, and the patient acceptance of labors and true mortifications, which is the myrrh. All that you do for the Lord, you should offer up to Him with ardent affection. Chapter 17 The Purification After the departure of the Magi, the Mother of God said to St. Joseph, My Master, dispose of all the offerings of the kings as belonging to my son and to yourself. I deserve nothing. Together they divided the gifts into three parts, one for the temple, the incense and myrrh and some of the gold, another for the priest who had circumcised the child, and the rest for the poor. A devout woman whom Mary had helped urged the Holy Family to move into her modest home, and they humbly accepted her invitation. Sadly, they took leave of the Holy Stable after cleaning it thoroughly. During the days that remained before the purification, when alone with his beloved mother, the infant Jesus often murmured to her, My dove, my chosen one, my dearest mother, make thyself like unto me. When the poor women and children of Bethlehem came to visit Mary, she gave them gifts and tactfully instructed them in the knowledge of God, the mysteries concerning the expected Messiah's, and the practice of virtues in everyday life. Sometimes their superficial talk about such matters was so full of confusion that it made St. Joseph smile secretly. Yet he continuously marveled at Mary's patience, firmness, and gentleness in leading these poor people to the truth, as well as at her great humility and reserve. When the fortieth day after the Nativity drew near, the Immaculate Mother of God did not hesitate to subject herself to the general Hebrew law requiring the purification of mothers and the presentation of firstborn sons in the temple at Jerusalem. For she saw in the soul of her divine Son that he wished to offer himself as a living victim to the Eternal Father in the temple. Consequently, Mary and Joseph gratefully took leave of the good woman who had sheltered them and went with Jesus to the cave of the Nativity for a last visit. Having gently placed the Christ child on the ground at the very spot where he was born, they both knelt and prayed fervently together, and they did the same where he had been circumcised. Then, as usual before a journey, Mary asked her husband for his blessing and on this special occasion for his permission to make the trip on foot and with bare feet. But St. Joseph replied kindly yet firmly, May the Son of the Eternal Father, whom I hold in my arms, give you his blessing. You may travel to Jerusalem on foot, but not barefooted, because of the weather. Prostrating herself on the ground for the last time in the Grotto of the Nativity, with all her heart, Mary thanked the infant Jesus for the marvelous blessings which he had given to Joseph and herself and to all mankind in the stable of Bethlehem. 
and she prayed to God that this holy place might always be revered by Christians. Rising to her feet, she covered herself with her cloak and took her baby into her arms, pressing him to her breast to protect him from the cold winter wind. Then, after the infant God had visibly given them his blessing, Joseph and Mary set out for Jerusalem, accompanied by a donkey bearing their few belongings and the gifts for the temple. Some of the good shepherds bade them a sad and touchingly affectionate farewell. During the five-mile journey, the weather was unusually severe. Cold, sleety winds made the child Jesus shiver and weep. Toward evening, having traveled slowly with several resting periods, the Holy Family reached the city gate of Jerusalem and found a welcome lodging in the humble home of a devout old couple without children. Then, at Mary's suggestion, St. Joseph went alone to the temple and made an anonymous donation of the myrrh, incense, and gold in order to avoid any ostentation of wealth at the ceremony the following day. The Holy Mother of God spent the night before the purification in fervent prayer. Speaking to the Eternal Father, she said, My Lord and my God, a festive day for heaven and earth will be that on which I offer the living victim to thee in thy temple. In return, this is what I ask of thee, my Lord. Pour forth thy mercies upon mankind, pardoning sinners, consoling the afflicted, and helping the needy. My soul shall magnify thee forever. That night, the holy man Simeon, a very old and thin priest with a short beard, was kneeling at prayer in a tiny cell of the great temple in Jerusalem. The Holy Ghost who dwelt in him had already revealed to him that he was not to die until he had seen the promised Messiah. Now, while he was praying in ecstasy, an angel appeared to him and told him to observe carefully the first child presented to the priest the next morning for that child would be the savior of the world for whom he longed so much. The angel also informed Simeon that he would die soon afterward. The old man was inflamed with joy. The holy matron Anna was likewise favored with a vision concerning the purification and she rejoiced greatly because she had been one of Mary's teachers during her stay in the temple as a girl. Before dawn, the Holy Family left their lodging in Jerusalem and went to the temple, accompanied by thousands of invisible chanting angels. At the entrance of the women's court, Mary knelt and humbly presented herself to God with His Son in her arms. She was dressed in a light blue robe, over which she wore a long yellow mantle and a white veil. The simple and devout old priest Simeon, who had been waiting for several hours already, could no longer restrain his impatience. Moved by the Holy Spirit, he went to meet his Lord, and in the hallway he caught sight of both mother and child surrounded by a wonderful light. After saying a few words to Mary, with the greatest joy he took the divine child into his arms and pressed him to his heart. Then he quietly withdrew into another part of the building while Mary was led by a woman to the temple court. Saint Joseph had given the basket with the two turtle doves to Anna and then passed through another door to the men's section. In the large ceremonial hall everything was prepared. On the walls many lamps hung in pyramid form. Several priests had placed in front of the altar a long table covered with a white cloth on which rested a cradle-like container and two baskets. Simeon came to Mary and led her to the table where she placed in the cradle the child Jesus, who was wrapped in a long sky-blue veil. Then she was led back to the grilled-in women's section in which about twenty mothers with their firstborn sons were waiting their turn. The holy temple now seemed to be filled with a heavenly light. Almighty God was present there. 
And above the child, the heavens seemed to open before the throne of the Holy Trinity. Simeon and three other priests, having put on their ceremonial vestments, took their places around the table and prayed over the babe. Then Anna gave Mary the basket with her offerings of fruit and coins, and Simeon again led her to the table. One of the priests took up the child, raised him toward heaven, and turned to Simeon, who placed him back in the virgin's arms and recited over them both some prayers from a rolled manuscript. Then Simeon led Mary back to Anna, who accompanied her to the women's section. After these ceremonies were over, Simeon came to Mary and received the infant Jesus from her hands. Then, raising his eyes to heaven in an ecstasy of joy, he offered the child to the Eternal Father, glorifying God for having fulfilled the promises and saying, Now thou dost dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word in peace. Because my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and a glory for thy people Israel. St. Joseph had come to join Mary, and he listened with deep respect to the inspired words of the old man. Simeon blessed them both. Then addressing himself to Mary, who was luminous like a heavenly rose, he added, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and for the rise of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. At the moment when the priest mentioned the sword and the sign of contradiction, which were prophetical of the passion and death of the Lord, the child Jesus bowed his head, thereby ratifying the prophecy and accepting it as the sentence of the Eternal Father pronounced by his minister. All this was understood by Mary, and she began to feel sorrow. For as in a mirror her spirit was made to see the mysteries included in this prophecy. All these things remained indelibly impressed on her memory. Anna the prophetess was also inspired and proclaimed the child's mother blessed. Mary then humbly kissed the hand of the priest and again asked his blessing, and she did the same to Anna, her former teacher. Then, with St. Joseph and her divine child, she returned to her lodging. Not long afterward, both Simeon and Anna passed away in peace. The Blessed Virgin said to St. Bridget of Sweden, I did not need purification like other women, because my son, who was born of me, made me clean. Nevertheless, that the law and the prophecies might be fulfilled, I chose to live according to the law. Nor did I live like worldly parents, but humbly conversed with the humble. Nor did I wish to show anything extraordinary in me, but loved whatever was humble. On that day of the purification, my pain was increased. For though by divine inspiration I knew that my son was to suffer, yet this grief pierced my heart more keenly at Simeon's words. And until I was assumed in body and soul to heaven, this grief never left my heart, although it was tempered by the consolation of the Spirit of God. Let not then this grief leave thy heart, for without tribulation few would reach heaven. And to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda, My daughter, the doctrine and example contained in this mystery will teach thee to strive after the constancy and expansion of heart, by which thou mayest prepare thyself to accept blessings and adversity, the sweet and the bitter, with equanimity. How persistently the human heart forgets that its teacher and master has first accepted sufferings. 
and has honored and sanctified them in his own person. Remember the sorrow that pierced my heart at the prophecies of Simeon and how I remained in peace and tranquility even though my heart and soul were transfixed by a sword of pain. Seek ever to preserve inward peace. Full of trust in me, whenever tribulation comes over thee, fervently exclaim, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Chapter 18 The Flight to Egypt After the purification, Mary and Joseph decided to stay in Jerusalem for nine days in order to renew their offering of the child Jesus and to acknowledge their gratitude for the great blessing which God had given them. Every day, therefore, from noon until midnight, they prayed humbly in an obscure corner of the temple. On the fifth day, the Lord said to Mary, My spouse and my dove, You cannot finish the nine days' devotion. Herod is seeking the life of the child. In order to save your son's life, you must flee with him and Joseph into the land of Egypt. The journey is long, hard, and very tiring. Suffer it all for my sake, for I am and always will be with you. The Mother of God answered meekly, My Lord, dispose of me according to thy will. I ask only that thou permit not my son to suffer, and that thou turn all pains and hardships upon me. But as she left the temple with the infant Jesus in her arms, Mary's compassionate heart was filled with sorrow for him, and she wept. At home, in their two rented rooms, she prudently kept the disturbing news to herself, since she had not been told to reveal it to her husband. Saint Joseph noticed that she was troubled, but he thought that it was due to Simeon's prophecy. That night, while Joseph was sleeping, an angel in the radiant form of a young man appeared in his room and said to him, Arise and take the child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and remain there until I tell thee, for Herod will seek the child to destroy him. Taking Joseph by the hand, the angel raised him up and vanished. As St. Joseph dressed hurriedly, he was greatly worried for Mary's sake and for the safety of the child Jesus. He lit his lamp and, after knocking on the door of his wife's room, humbly asked her whether he could come in. Then, upon entering, he said to her anxiously, My lady, God wills that we should be tried further, for his holy angel has announced to me that we must flee to Egypt with the child, because Herod is planning to take his life. Prepare yourself, my dear wife, to bear the hardships of the journey and tell me what I can do to alleviate them. My husband and my master, replied Mary calmly, if we have received from God such great blessings and graces, it is fitting that we should joyfully accept temporal suffering. Wherever we go, we carry our Lord with us, and He is our comfort and our country. So let us proceed to fulfill his holy will. Then she went to the crib at the foot of the bed where the infant Jesus was sleeping, and falling on her knees she awakened him and took him in her arms. At first the divine babe wept a little, but when Mary and Joseph asked him for his blessing, he gave it to them visibly. After St. Joseph had hurriedly packed their few belongings on the donkey that had traveled with them from Nazareth, the Holy Family left Jerusalem shortly before midnight on their long and dangerous trip to Egypt. Mary held in her arms the infant Jesus, who was well wrapped in swaddling clothes and supported by a large piece of linen which was tied around his mother's neck. The Blessed Virgin wore a long cloak that covered her and the child, 
and also a wide veil. Although Mary and Joseph were filled with anxiety for Jesus, they felt greatly encouraged when, as they went through the city gate, all the splendid angel protectors of the Mother of God again appeared in bright human forms and changed the night into day for them. As the Holy Family journeyed southward in the direction of Bethlehem, Mary longed to visit and again venerate the Holy Grotto of the Nativity, but her angels informed her that such a delay would be dangerous. Then, with St. Joseph's permission, she sent one of the angels to warn St. Elizabeth to hide with her son John in the desert around the town of Hebron, where they were then living. The Holy Family spent their first night in a cave in the hills south of Bethlehem, off the regular caravan route. They were thirsty and exhausted, and Mary was so sorry for her child that she wept. But at her prayer, a spring of clear water suddenly gushed forth, and a wild goat came to them and allowed Joseph to milk it. Late the next day, as they were crossing the desert near Hebron, they ran out of water, and both Mary and Joseph suffered keenly from thirst. St. Elizabeth and John were then hiding in a cave on a hill nearby. Suddenly John felt that his Lord was close and was suffering. He fell on his knees and prayed fervently with his arms extended. St. Elizabeth sent one of her servants with generous gifts of money, food, and clothing to the Holy Family, which he overtook near Gaza. There they rested briefly while Mary shared these gifts with the poor and healed several sick and crippled women. Then the Holy Family set out on the long and difficult journey across the great desert between Palestine and Egypt. While it was still dark, they had to pass through a stretch of ground infested with many dangerous snakes, which slithered toward them and reared up, hissing menacingly, but did not harm them. During the first night in the desert, the Holy Family rested at the foot of a small sand dune. After they had eaten, and after Mary had nursed her babe, St. Joseph made a sort of tent with his cloak and some sticks in order to protect the mother and child from the wind, and he slept near them on the ground, resting his head on the sack that contained their belongings. Mary now perceived that Jesus was offering up to his Father all their hardships, and she did likewise, praying with him and with her angels most of the night. Within a few days, the poor travelers had exhausted all their small provisions of fruit and bread and water, although they tried to make their supply last longer by not eating several times until nine o'clock at night. And while they were thus suffering from hunger and thirst and fatigue, a strong wind and sandstorm arose. Finally, at Mary's fervent prayer for her son and her husband, the Lord commanded her angels to serve them some nourishing food and drink. During the long journey, while Mary walked or rode on the donkey, always holding her divine son in her arms, she often thanked him for having made her his mother. Three times a day she nursed him, and whenever they stopped for a rest, she caressed him tenderly. A few times the infant Jesus wept tears of love and compassion for mankind, and Mary would weep too. Often mother and son conversed mystically. At other times St. Joseph would talk with Mary, frequently asking her what he could do for her or Jesus. Sometimes he would humbly and devoutly kiss the feet of the divine child and take him in his arms and beg him for his blessing. Thus the Holy Family passed the ten days of their flight across the barren desert, consoling and cheering one another in mutual kindness and love. Several times when they were resting, a great number of birds came flying toward Mary and entertained her by perching on her shoulders and hands, chirping affectionately and joyfully. Then she urged them to be thankful to God for their beautiful plumage, their freedom in the air, and their daily food on the ground, 
and she joined them in singing lovely lullabies for the infant Jesus. And often she sang hymns of praise to the Lord with her angels. Once, when the travelers were completely lost and did not know which way to go, Mary and Joseph were deeply troubled for a moment. But after they had prayed fervently for help, some wild animals came toward them in a friendly manner and ran off in a certain direction, thus indicating the right way. One evening, the Holy Family arrived at the camp of some highway robbers who were at first inclined to treat them cruelly. But when the leader looked at the infant Jesus, somehow his hard heart was deeply touched and he ordered his men not to harm the travelers. Taking them into his hut, he had his wife give them some food and settle them comfortably in a corner. At Mary's request, the woman brought her a large container filled with water in which the Blessed Virgin gave her son a bath and washed his swaddling clothes. Meanwhile, the chief robber said to his wife, That is no ordinary child. He is a holy baby. Ask his mother to let you bathe our leprous son in the water she has used. Perhaps it will heal him. But before the woman said a word, Mary urged her to wash her sick son in the water. Then the mother brought in her three-year-old boy, whose leprosy was so advanced that it covered all his face and body. Yet as soon as he was placed in the water that Jesus had used, which was now clearer than it had been before, the sick boy's skin became perfectly smooth and healthy. His mother was almost beside herself with joy and gratitude. She tried to kiss Mary and Jesus, but the mother of God gently held her off and did not let her touch either of them. The father told all his men about the miracle, and they crowded into the hut and stared at the Holy Family with awe. Later, Mary had a long talk with the mother, who promised that she would stop living from crime as soon as she could. That night, Mary hardly slept at all. She remained sitting on her bed, praying. The next morning, when the Holy Family left with some new provisions, the robber chief gratefully said goodbye to them and exclaimed with deep emotion, Remember me wherever you are. Thirty-three years later, his robber son said to the man crucified beside him on Calvary, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And that time, again due to Mary's prayers, Jesus healed his soul. Within a few days, although nearing the end of their trip, the Holy Family was once more utterly exhausted and suffering intensely from hunger and thirst. While they were resting on a sand dune, Mary prayed again for help, and a spring of water began to flow beside her. After they had quenched their thirst, she bathed the infant Jesus in the water. Then, as they approached the delta of the Nile, they camped under a tall date tree, which at Mary's prayer bent over so that they could pick and eat its fruit. That night they spent in the shelter of a great hollow sycamore tree. Finally, after ten days of torture on the endless sands of the desert, the Holy Family reached the fertile land of Egypt. Our Lord said to St. Bridget of Sweden, by my flight to Egypt, I showed the infirmities of my humanity and fulfilled the prophecies. I gave, too, an example to my disciples that sometimes persecution is to be avoided for the greater future glory of God. That I was not found by my pursuers, the counsel of my divinity prevailed over the counsel of man, for it is not easy to fight against God. And the Blessed Virgin said to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreta, I was not alarmed in my exile and prolonged journey. Since I trusted in the Lord, He provided for me in the time of my need. Even when help is somewhat delayed, it will always be at hand at a time when it will do most good. 
Thus it happened with me and my husband in the time of our destitution and necessity. Chapter 19 The Holy Family in Egypt After the Holy Family had fled from Palestine, King Herod, seeing that he had been tricked by the Magi, was exceedingly angry. And he gave a secret order to his officers in Bethlehem to kill all male children under two years of age. The slaughter of the innocents took place in a large courtyard of a palace to which the mothers and children had been summoned. Executioners armed with swords and spears proceeded to cut the throats or pierce the chests of the infants and to throw their bodies onto a pile before the eyes of the helpless and frantic mothers who screamed and tore their hair. While this frightful atrocity was occurring, Mary and Jesus in Egypt were mystically aware of it. With heartbroken anguish, Mary joined her divine son in praying for the souls of the murdered children and for their grieving parents. Jesus asked his father to reward these first fruits of his own passion with the crown of martyrdom and his request was granted. Although the Blessed Virgin was very anxious to know how young John the Baptist had escaped the massacre, she refrained from asking the Lord to enlighten her. But he soon informed her that St. Elizabeth and John had escaped from Herod's soldiers by hiding in a cave in the desert where they were now living under the greatest hardships. Mary therefore immediately obtained the permission of Jesus to send them provisions by means of her angels. A few years later, when John was only four years old, his saintly mother died peacefully, assisted by Mary's angels who also helped to bury her in the desert. Young John was then supported by a holy hermit who often visited him. The forerunner of Christ grew up in the wilderness, living a hard and solitary life of ever-increasing prayer and mortification. He received his education not from men, but directly from the Holy Spirit. His only companions were the wild animals of the desert, with whom he was on friendly terms. The birds especially loved to come and perch on his shoulders or on his staff while he talked to them familiarly. Often, too, he conversed with angels, humbly, yet with all the innocent frankness of a deeply religious boy. When the Holy Family entered the pagan land of Egypt, the infant Jesus, in the arms of his mother, raised his eyes and hands to the Eternal Father and asked for the salvation of its inhabitants. And as they arrived at the town of Heliopolis, or City of the Sun, he used his divine power to drive the demons from the idols in the temples. Some of the idols then crashed to the ground and broke into many pieces, causing a great commotion among the people. Saint Joseph found a poor and humble three-room house at a small distance from the town. Upon entering this new home, the Mother of God knelt on the ground and kissed it with profound humility thanking the Lord for giving them this place of rest after their long and hard journey. She dedicated all that she was to do there to the glory of God, and she offered to take upon herself all the trials and labors of their exile. Then she set about cleaning the rooms. During the next three days, the Holy Family was so completely destitute that they had to live on whatever St. Joseph could beg for them. Then he succeeded in obtaining work in his trade as a carpenter, but he was not well treated by the persons who employed him. Looking upon him as a foreigner and a refugee, they paid him whatever they pleased. Sometimes, after a whole day's work, he was not able to bring any money home. As the house was without any furniture, he soon made a couch for Mary and a cradle for Jesus, as well as some low tables and stools. Of the three rooms, they assigned one to the mother and child, and the other two to St. Joseph as his bedroom and workshop. The Holy Family adjusted themselves to their poverty calmly and even joyfully. However, Mary decided to help in earning their living. She therefore began to do needlework for some good women in the Jewish colony, and soon her reputation for skill and quality work spread so that she was never in want of employment. But she always refused to do any frivolous fashion pieces, although her attitude aroused criticism among some of her customers. 
While she sewed, the infant Jesus lay quietly in his cradle beside her. Due to the many hours which she now spent at this work, she had to devote more of the night hours to prayer and contemplation. Her divine son was greatly pleased with her zeal and acceptance of poverty, and wishing to lessen her labor, one day he said to her, My mother, I wish to make a rule for your daily life and work. From nightfall you will take some sleep and rest. From midnight until dawn we will praise the Eternal Father together. Then prepare the necessary food for yourself and Joseph, and afterward give me food and hold me in your arms until noon, when you will place me in the arms of your husband to give him some refreshment in his labors. Then retire and return to your work until it is time to prepare the evening meal and pray continually to the Eternal Father for sinners. Mary and Joseph had the infant Jesus with them as they took their meals. Whenever St. Joseph wished to caress the Divine Child, he humbly asked Mary's permission, and taking the little Jesus in his arms, he was so filled with tender joy and love that he forgot all his hardships or even considered them easy and sweet. Both Mary and Joseph often received such heartwarming consolations from Jesus that they gladly accepted all their trials for love of Him. While the Holy Family was in Egypt, they joyfully celebrated the first anniversary of the Annunciation and later of the Nativity. On each occasion, Mary prepared for the anniversary by nine days of prayer and celebrated it by prostrating herself before the infant Jesus in the form of a cross, begging him to thank the Eternal Father for all the graces which the gift of his only begotten Son was bringing to her and to the whole human race. Then, inflamed with the love of God, she rose up and sang beautiful hymns alternately with her angels to honor her son. Until this time, the Divine Child had spoken only to his mother and only when alone with her. Now, when he reached the age of one year, he decided to break his silence and speak to his foster father. One day, therefore, when Mary and Joseph were talking together with deep reverence about the marvelous goodness of God as manifested in the Incarnation, the child Jesus, resting in his mother's arms, said to Saint Joseph, in a clear voice, My Father. Upon hearing the infant God call him Father, Joseph, his heart thrilling with new love, gratitude, and joy, fell on his knees before Jesus, and while tears ran down his cheeks, thanked him for such a grace, and begged him to enlighten him and enable him in all things to fulfill God's holy will. Then Jesus continued, I have come from heaven upon this earth in order to be the light of the world and in order to rescue it from the darkness of sin, to seek and to know my sheep as a good shepherd, to give them the nourishment of eternal life, to teach them the way to heaven and to open its gates which had been closed by their sins. And I desire that you both be children of the light which you have so close to you. Now Mary placed Jesus in the cradle and kneeling before him said, My son and sweetest love of my soul, thou hast been oppressed for a long time by the swaddling clothes. Tell me, my Lord, what shall I do to place thee freely on thy feet? My mother, replied the child Jesus, on account of the love which I bear toward men, the swathings of my childhood have not seemed irksome to me, for when I shall be grown up, I shall be bound and delivered to my enemies to be put to death. I wish to possess only one garment during all my life, for I seek nothing more than what is sufficient to cover me. Clothe me, my mother, in a tunic of a lowly and ordinary color.
This alone will I wear, and it shall grow with me. Over this garment they shall cast lots at my death. Men shall see that I was born and wish to live poor and destitute of visible things, which, being earthly, oppress and darken the heart of man. I shall not have anything to do with visible things, except to offer them up to the Eternal Father, renouncing them for His love, and making use of only so much as is sufficient to sustain my natural life, which I will afterward yield up for man's sake. By this example I wish to impress upon the world the doctrine that it must love poverty and not despise it. But Mary replied, My son and my Lord, thy mother has not the heart to allow thee to go barefoot at this tender age. Permit me, my love, to provide some kind of covering to protect thy feet. I also fear that the rough garment which thou askest of me will wound thy tender body if thou wearest no linen beneath. My mother, I will permit a slight and ordinary covering for my feet until the time of my public preaching, for I must do that barefooted, but I do not wish to wear linen. Mary, therefore, set about at once preparing her son's robe. She obtained some natural and uncolored wool, and spinning it very finely with her own hands, she wove it on a small loom into a one-piece garment without any seam. At her request, its color was changed to a unique mixture of brown and silver gray. She also made a half tunic as undergarment and a pair of strong sandals. When all was ready, after humbly asking her divine son's permission, Mary carefully and lovingly clothed him and set him on his feet. Although she had taken no measurements beforehand, the robe fitted him perfectly, covering his feet without hindering him in walking, and the sleeves extended to the middle of his hands. The collar was round in front and somewhat raised around the neck. Our Lord never took off this robe, until his executioners tore it off at the scourging and the crucifixion. For, by divine power, it continually grew with him, adjusting itself to his body. Nor did it ever become worn in appearance or lose its color. And it always remained spotlessly clean. Then Mary gently placed the infant God on his feet for the first time and he took his first steps on this earth. He was by far the most beautiful child who has ever lived. Upon seeing him standing there in his plain and humble robe, the angels marveled, while Mary and Joseph were filled with new love and joy. The mother of God continued to nurse her son until he was a year and a half old. Then he began to take frugal meals of broth mixed with oil and some fruits and fish. He never asked for food, and later he ate all his meals with his mother and foster father. Then Mary always waited for him to give the blessing at the beginning and thanks at the end of each meal. Now that the child Jesus could walk, he began to retire and spend certain hours in prayer in his mother's room. As she silently wondered whether she should stay with him at such times, he said to her, My mother, remain with me always in order to imitate me in my actions, for I have chosen you as the vessel and model of all perfection. Mary therefore frequently joined him in praying for mankind. And sometimes when the divine child meditated on the ingratitude with which men would receive the redemption, she saw him weep and even perspire blood, and then she would sorrowfully wipe his little face. At other times she saw him resplendent with heavenly light and surrounded by sweetly chanting angels. Within a few years a number of children began to gather around the young Jesus, for he soon won their hearts by his kindness and qualities of leadership. They often came to visit him and he took them to drink at a fountain behind the house which Mary had discovered. With words full of life and strength, 
He instructed his little friends in the knowledge of God and the virtues, and his informal teaching made such a deep impression that all these boys later became great and saintly men. One day, as soon as he was strong enough, while Mary was praying in her room, the child Jesus took a pitcher and filled it with water at the fountain. When she saw him bringing it to her, she was profoundly moved. And from that day, Jesus always thoughtfully carried water for her whenever she needed it, without her having to ask for it. He also helped St. Joseph, handing him his tools or pieces of wood. When he was old enough, the boy Jesus took his mother's needlework to her customers in town and brought back some bread. Occasionally, after a trip to town, he wept over the suffering and sinning which he had seen in the city. He then began to visit the sick in the hospitals with his mother, seeking out those who were most afflicted in order to cheer and console them. Attracted by his charity and sanctity, they often gave him gifts, which he refused or accepted only for distribution among the poor. The merciful Mother of God did not hesitate to tend to the festering ulcers and sores of the women and she often changed their bandages with her own hands while comforting the suffering patients. Frequently she healed them and Saint Joseph was given power to cure some of the men. When a severe pestilence devastated the town, Jesus, Mary and Joseph nursed and healed many of the victims. As a result, the Holy Family became very popular among the people, especially among the poor and a large number of men and women came to them for advice and instruction. In order to honor his mother, Jesus told her to teach them the laws of the one true God. Speaking therefore to each individual in a way suited to his or her personality and problems, she urged them to give up their sinful ways of living in order to serve and worship the Lord in purity and in truth. Her gentle and modest manner and her penetrating messages were so moving and inspiring that many of her listeners were converted to a better life and eventually became Christians. Saint Joseph also helped in instructing the men in his own plain and sincere way. Thus the Holy Family sowed in Egypt the spiritual seed that was later to develop into many generations of holy Christians, saints, martyrs and hermits. The Blessed Virgin said to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreta, My daughter, I came into Egypt where I knew no relations or friends. In a land of foreign religion where I could offer no home or protection or assistance to my son whom I loved so much. It can easily be understood then what tribulations and hardships we suffered Thou canst not understand with what patience and resignation we accepted them. It is true, I grieved much to see my husband in such necessity and want, but at the same time I blessed the Lord to be able to suffer them. In this noble patience and joy of spirit, I wish thee to imitate me whenever the Lord offers thee an opportunity. My Most Holy Son chose poverty and taught it by word and by example. This same doctrine I taught and practiced during all my life. I wish thee to love and diligently to seek after this poverty. Chapter 20 The Return to Nazareth Some time after King Herod's death, God the Father decreed that the Holy Family should return to Palestine. Mary learned of this decision one day while she was praying with Jesus, but neither of them made it known to St. Joseph. The good foster father of our Lord had been very sad lately because he had not been paid for his work, and he often begged God on his knees to help his family in their growing need. Then one night during his sleep, an angel appeared to him and said, Arise and take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. Upon awakening, 
St. Joseph immediately told Mary and Jesus about the Lord's command, and they both answered that God's will must be done. They therefore decided to leave Egypt without delay. They distributed their furniture among the poor, and St. Joseph packed their few belongings on their faithful donkey, which had come from Palestine with them. As the news of their departure spread, many of their Jewish and Egyptian friends gathered around them and said goodbye with touching sorrow. When the Holy Family, accompanied by Mary's many angels, set out to cross the desert again, they were wearing light head coverings made of bark as protection against the sun. Mary had sandals, and Jesus wore bark shoes. Often they had to stop and shake the sand out of his shoes, and sometimes he was so tired that he had to ride on the donkey. All three suffered a great deal on this long trip, although occasionally the Divine Child miraculously provided strengthening food for them. When they reached Palestine, hearing that the new king was cruel, St. Joseph was afraid to settle in Bethlehem as he had hoped to do. And after an angel warned him one night in a dream, the Holy Family followed the coast, past Mount Carmel, and arriving at last in Nazareth, went to their former home, which had been cared for in their absence by a cousin of St. Joseph. When Mary entered the house with her husband and her son, she immediately prostrated herself on the ground and fervently thanked the Lord for having led them safely through their long exile and hard journeys. After they had settled in their home, Mary, who always observed perfect order in all her arrangements and habits, set up a rule of life for herself so that she could again spend much time in prayer. St. Joseph took up his carpentry work, humbly rejoicing in the knowledge that he was laboring to support God himself and his beloved mother. Young Jesus, besides helping Joseph and Mary whenever he could, soon became the most popular boy in Nazareth. All his young friends, among whom were his future apostles John and James the Elder, loved him so much that they tried hard not to displease him. When a child was disobedient, the parents would therefore say, What will little Jesus think of you? How sorry he will be! Sometimes they even brought their naughty sons to him and asked him to make them good. Then, with striking simplicity and kindness, while playing with his young friends, Jesus would urge them not to hurt their parents anymore. He would also persuade them to pray with him to the good Lord to give them the strength to change. Then he would inspire them to go home, admit their faults, and sincerely ask their parents to forgive them. At this time, Jesus was a slender boy and rather tall for his age. Though somewhat pale, he had a clear complexion, and his handsome face was radiant with health. He had a broad and high forehead, and his dark brown hair, which was parted in the middle, fell to his shoulders. Soon after their return from Egypt, the Lord resolved to test Mary's love for him by seeming to treat her coldly and impersonally for a while. Therefore, without any warning, Jesus began to be very reserved with his mother, speaking to her only rarely and very gravely. Most of the time he avoided her company, and when she came to him, or when they were at meals together, he would neither speak to her nor even look at her. Naturally, Mary was deeply disturbed, for with her usual humility she feared that somehow she had offended God through some fault. She therefore examined her conscience minutely and racked her memory for some evidence of ingratitude. Although she could find not even one slight venial sin, nevertheless she humbled herself more than ever and acknowledged that she deserved such treatment. Yet with ardent longing she begged the Lord in unceasing prayer to pardon her and restore her to his favor. This trial lasted thirty days. Then one day, as Mary knelt at the feet of Jesus, he said to her with great tenderness, Arise, my mother. 
and his words had such a profound effect on her that she was wrapped into a prolonged ecstasy in which many divine mysteries were revealed to her. When she came out of her trance and adored her son, she was again privileged to contemplate his holy soul as before. Henceforth, until the time of his public ministry, Jesus regularly taught her the truths of the Christian religion, which he was later to give to his church. Chapter 21 The Boy Jesus in the Temple Like all the Jews, the Holy Family went to the temple in Jerusalem at least once a year to celebrate the Pasch in April. The boy Jesus first took the long trip when he was eight years old, and he wished that it be made entirely on foot. Often he became tired and overheated, and then, with tender compassion, his mother would ask him to rest while she gently wiped his face. Some nights they spent in inns, and some in the open fields. In the great temple, Mary observed how Jesus prayed to his Father in heaven for the whole human race. And when she thought of her son's future sufferings in that same city, he would turn to her and urge her to offer up those sufferings with him for the salvation of men. Several times in the temple, she heard the voice of the Eternal Father declare, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. After Jesus reached the age of twelve, the Holy Family made their yearly pilgrimage to the temple and spent seven days with friends in Jerusalem. But this time, when Mary and Joseph left the city and were on their way back to Nazareth, the child Jesus withdrew from them without their knowledge. Not far from the city gate, he turned and hastened back through the streets. In his divine omniscience, he foresaw all that was to happen, and he offered it up to his eternal Father for the benefit of souls. During the next three days, he spent part of his time begging and visiting the hospitals of the poor, consoling the sick and giving them the alms he had received. Secretly, he restored bodily health to some and spiritual health to many. Then, joining some boys, he went to three schools, on each day to a different one. The questions and answers of the twelve-year-old Jesus surprised and irritated the teachers and priests of these schools so much that they decided on the third afternoon to have him publicly tested in the temple by their most famous experts in order to embarrass and humiliate him. For though they began by applauding the boy's knowledge, they soon felt a secret envy and jealousy. They all met accordingly in the great hall of the temple, where our Lord often taught later on. It was a vast auditorium in which crowds of people circulated casually, making it hard to recognize as a place dedicated to the service of God. Jesus was seated in a large throne-like chair that he could not wholly fill. Around him were grouped a number of aged Israelites dressed as priests. He had stepped into their midst with remarkable majesty and grace, and by his pleasing appearance he awakened in these learned men a desire to hear him. They listened to him very intently, but with growing fury. As on the preceding days, Jesus in his replies had brought in analogies from nature and art, the scholars had taken care to call in some specialist skilled in the various branches of learning. When several of them began to ask him questions relating to their fields, he told them that profane knowledge was not the proper subject for teaching in the temple, but that he would nevertheless answer them, because such was the will of his Father. They did not understand that he was referring to his heavenly Father and assumed that Joseph had told him to show them how much he knew. In replying to their questions, our Lord spoke first about medicine, and the way he described the human body aroused the admiration of the foremost doctors. Then he took up several matters pertaining to astronomy, architecture, agriculture, geometry, mathematics, and law. He was so skillful in correlating these different subjects with the promises, prophecies, and mysteries of their religion, its ceremonies and sacrifices, that his listeners were astounded and embarrassed. Finally, the discussion turned to the coming of the Messiah. Most of the Hebrew scholars maintained that he could not yet be due, 
because he was to come with kingly pomp and free his people by force from the Romans. But the boy Jesus, by quoting the other prophecies concerning the rejection and death of the Messiah, proved that the prophets had described his two different comings, first to redeem and then to judge mankind, and by recalling that the people of Israel were now in that very servitude which was foretold as a sure sign of his coming, Jesus demonstrated that the Messiah must already be among them. He even reminded them of the visit of the three Magi, seeking the king of the Jews. Thus, while seeming to ask questions, Jesus taught with divine conviction. The scribes and scholars who heard him refute their arguments were all at first dumbfounded and then furious with shame. They could not tolerate his teaching them things they did not know or his explaining the mysteries of the law better than they could. Meanwhile, during these three days, Mary and Joseph, their hearts filled with anxiety and self-reproach, had been searching in vain for Jesus among their relatives and friends. Although Mary knew that the time for her son's passion had not yet come, still she feared that Archelaus the king might have taken him prisoner and be mistreating him. Also, she wondered whether Jesus might have gone to live in the desert with John the Baptist. Throughout those three days, she neither ate nor slept. Though she often spoke with the angels that always accompanied her, they were not allowed to tell her where they knew Jesus was. And in her humility and prudence, she did not ask them. Since she did not know the cause of her loss, her anxiety was without measure, and yet she bore it with patience, resignation, and submission. Not for a moment did she lose her interior or exterior peace, or entertain a discouraging thought. And though her sorrow pierced her inmost heart, she never failed in reverence or ceased her prayers for the human race and for the grace of finding her son. One of the women she questioned exclaimed, That child came to my door yesterday begging for alms, and I gave him some. His grace and beauty touched my heart. I was moved to compassion at seeing such a lovely child in poverty and need. Later at the city hospital, Mary was told of Jesus' visits there. Then the thought occurred to her that since he was not with the poor, he was probably in the house of God and of prayer. Now the holy angels encouraged her and said, Our Queen and Our Lady, the hour of thy consolation is at hand. Soon thou wilt see the light of thine eyes. Hasten thy footsteps and go to the temple. Just at this moment, St. Joseph rejoined her, as they had been searching separately for a while. During all these three days, he had suffered indescribable sorrow and affliction, hastening from one place to another. In fact, he had been in serious danger of losing his life if God had not strengthened him, and if Mary had not consoled him and forced him to take some food and rest.